Hey folks, today I'm going to be doing a review and running some tests on this Kori car refrigerator. You can see it has a compressor there. So basically it's a 12 volt refrigerator with compressor, meaning it's going to perform similar to the refrigerator that you have in your house, the way it stays cold. And so, you know, these have become really popular over the last few years, these 12 volt compressor driven refrigerators. And this is Kori's iteration of it. And so they sent me this refrigerator. So like I said, I'm going to perform some tests on it. And the, the three questions that I want to answer through these tests are, first up, I want to see how long does it take to get cold from you know the ambient temperature, whether it's outside, like in our case today, or in your house, how long does it take to get cold up to the desired you know, set temperature? So we'll run that test. Then second, you know, how well does it perform once it's up to temperature? You know, every refrigerator has variations in, in temperature, you know, fluctuations as far as when the compressor kicks on and off. And so if we set the the refrigerator to let's say 38 degrees you know how close is it going to keep the temperature inside to that 38 degrees how much is it going to fluctuate above and beyond that set range and then the third question i think this will be really interesting is how much energy does it consume you know if you're going to buy this refrigerator and plug it into 12 volt power you know how much can you expect to get in a real world scenario and so we'll test that as well as you can see, the packaging is real simple. In this inner box, we've got the user manual, and then it looks like we've got the full handle assembly right here with a tool as well. So on the side, you'll notice it already has kind of a built-in handle here, kind of an inset handle, but I imagine if you want larger handles, you know, for better grip, you can take these screws out and then assemble the handles. So you do have those inset uh, little grips on both sides. If you don't want to install the handles or you've got clearance issues, then you don't have to necessarily do that. So that's all that. And then the other bag in here looks like just the power supply. We've got our 12 volt power supply and then it looks like our 120 volt AC power adapter here. So it's got the connector that goes to the cooler in here, uh, I guess a semi proprietary connector there and then just a standard two prong cable. And then this AC adapter is, so it's got an output of 14.5 volts, max six amps there or 87 watts. So that's the AC adapter. And then because it's native 12 volt for the DC plug, it's just a straight cable here. It's the same proprietary connector on this end. And then you've got your standard 12 volt plug there and the plug's going to go on the same side as the control panel here on the side you get a close-up of what that looks like you can see it is native 12 volt or 24 volt but it's got a real simple profile again you've got that inset handle you've got some vents here on this side and then if we rotate along we'll call this the front side you can see it does have some vents down here as well and you know all the compressor and everything is going to be under that section there you can see it's a little bit more shallow on this uh, freezer side here it's got a little notice label here just letting you know that it is going to take longer to cool down if the ambient temperature outside is warmer and then they've got the Kori logo on this front side the opposite side over here we got no vents or anything but same inset handle there as well and then if we flip it around to the back side pretty much a mirror image of the front you got your vents down here where the compressor is and then you've got as far as the lid goes a little bit of a pattern on the front here for grip and on the lid, it's got a little tip sticker here, just reminding you that it is a compressor driven refrigerator. And so as you know, compressor driven refrigerators, they have to be in their horizontal position while they operate. And if you're moving this, or for some reason it's been stored, you know, vertically, you wanna make sure it is sitting in this horizontal position for several hours. They say uh, at least 12 hours here on the label, just to make sure that that oil, you know, settled down properly into the compressor. Which speaking of which, this is an important consideration that this unit should always be in this horizontal position. You never want to, you know, flip it upright or anything like that and use it because that could potentially damage the compressor and it probably wouldn't work very well. So it does have to be in this horizontal position. Then off to the right side, let's take a quick look at the controls here. So it's got some protective plastic over the control panel here. We've got a USB-A port. That's kind of handy. And then we've got an on off, a setting unlock switch, and then we've got adjustments for the big box 
and the small box. So they're referring to the, the big box over here and the smaller section. So you can adjust those temperatures individually and then you've got a little LCD display over there that will light up once we plug it in here in just a minute. But before we plug it in and do all those tests, let me give you some dimensions of it. I know the manufacturer always lists them out, but sometimes the real world dimensions are a little bit different. And so let me give you what those are. We're gonna start on the inside here on the big box on this side. It does have this little removable storage basket here and it's got a little divider in there. So that fits fairly snugly inside of that component there. Let's look at the actual dimensions though of this big box here. It appears to be straight. The wall's going all the way down. So I'm gonna measure at the top here. And you've got just over 13 inches, about 13 and a 16th at the top here. And then here on the length, you've got 11 and 1 8 inches. And then as far as the depth goes to the top of this casing here, to the top where the lid is, it's 10 and a half inches all the way down. There is a very slight uh, rounded edge here on the bottom. And then, I don't know if you can see that, but there is a drain plug as well on the bottom. If you get any liquids in there and you need to drain it out. And I do see an LED light here that I missed before, so that's kind of handy. Let's take a look at the, the smaller box. So this one's gonna be five and an eighth across, five and one eighth inches. And it's gonna be 11 and one eighth inches long there. And this one's of course much shallower. This one is, I'd say just barely over four inches deep. And so that's gonna be the smaller box there. And I do see a nice gasket all the way around on both of the sections that'll make sure that's nice and sealed up. The hinge is made out of metal right there, so that's nice. Let's go ahead and shut it though and get the dimensions on the outside. Now I don't have the handles installed, so I'm giving you just the raw dimensions without those handles, nothing you know protruding on the outside. The top, it looks like the length is gonna be right at, I'd say 25 and 3 eighths. I'm looking at the screw heads here, the buttons that kind of stick out on those screw heads. And yeah, 25 and 3 eighths. And then on the width here, we don't really have anything protruding off to the, the side here on the width. So I'm looking right at 14 and a half inches across. And then the overall height here, I'm gonna say 15 and 3 eighths, it looks like. It is kind of rounded, so it's hard to get that measurement, but I'm gonna say 15 and 3 eighths inches tall. Now, if we add the handles on the outside, I'll let you know what those dimensions are too, because these will definitely make it a lot easier to cart around. So you can see, basically, they give you the two mounting brackets here, and then the handle itself, it's got little slots in it so it doesn't rotate. So that's kind of what it looks like there. And then they give you a little tool, it's an Allen key. The handles do stick out, looks like about an inch and I'd say an inch and five eighths on each side there. So that means the overall length here on the cooler, it's gonna be right at about, looks like 28 and a half inches long there. Okay, now for the testing. This is gonna be the fun part of the video, at least for me. And so remember, the questions that I'm gonna answer are first off, how long does it take for the refrigerator to get up to the desired set temperature? Then second, we're gonna look at the performance of the refrigerator once it's up to that desired set temperature, how well does it keep up at that temperature? What kind of variations are there in temperature? And then third, we're gonna look at how much energy the refrigerator consumes over a longer time period. Okay, so let me go over the parameters for this experiment, how I'm gonna you know, hook everything up here in just a moment. I'm gonna be using the battery bank here on my fifth wheel, on my RV. I've got just a real humble 200 amp hour lithium battery bank here. So just two Battleborn batteries hooked up together. And I've got the master battery disconnect switch here on the RV enabled here so that nothing, there's absolutely no load whatsoever on the, the batteries. It's just gonna be the cooler because we wanna make sure whatever amp draw we're getting and reading is only the refrigerator and nothing else. And the reason I'm using this battery bank here is because I think it's a pretty average battery bank for, for what people are gonna be using with the refrigerator like this. But also I've got the Victron battery monitor already hooked up to it. And so it'll give us some good data. In fact, you can see right now with that battery disconnect, I've got zero amp draw right now just to prove that it truly is disconnected. But this will give us some interesting data along the way. So I'm gonna be using that. And I've just got a basic alligator clamp uh, on the positive and the negative end of the shunt there. 
and then just a 12 volt plug here. So that's what I'll be connecting the cooler to. And then as far as the temperature goes, I'm gonna be using this GoV temperature sensor. So I'm gonna put this inside the big box portion. But I'm gonna put this inside here. This has been acclimating to just the ambient temperature for the last few hours outside here, which by the way, it is 77 degrees outside. And we're kind of in the shade. We're getting a little bit of indirect sunlight here, but mostly in the shade there. So let's go ahead and plug this in and I'll start the timer as soon as I plug it in so we get an idea of how long it takes to get up to the desired set temperature. So I'm gonna plug it in here and I hear a little beep now on the cooler, the display flashed here. We're gonna go ahead and turn it on. Okay, so to turn it on, you just have to hold down on the on off switch there and then it looks like it's gonna to default to whatever it was set to prior. Let's check on the big box here and see, so it's set to 32. I'm gonna change it to, how about we do 36 degrees? That's a pretty, you know, I'd say average temperature. So we've got that set to 36 degrees. And then the small box, let's go ahead and set that down to seven degrees. And that way, that one's gonna be set to, to freeze. So I think that's pretty modest. I mean, some people for freezing might go even colder. But again, we've got seven degrees set on the small box, and then we've got 36 degrees set on the, the big box there. Then if I pull up my Victron battery monitor here, you can see now we've got an amp draw on it. A very small 40 watts right now, and so it's showing at this rate, we've got a little over four days remaining. But again, we'll come back and check this. But you can see we are at 100% there. And again, this is a 200 amp hour battery bank. Then as far as the temperature sensor goes, just to see where we're starting out here. So this is with the GoV sensor that's inside there. And you can see it's starting out at 78.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the starting kind of the ambient temperature outside right now. And then we'll go ahead and start the stopwatch here on my watch so that we can get an idea of how long it's gonna take. All right, so we are starting the stopwatch there. And now we're gonna come back and see, once it gets up to temperature, I'll report back and we'll see how much time has elapsed. And while it's getting up to temperature, I'll just give you some close-up looks of what the control panel looks like. If this is flashing for you in the video, it's not in real life, it just has something to do with the, the refresh frequency while I'm recording here. But you can see, I just turned it on. I had to hold this on off for a few seconds. And then I did notice it seems to lock out the controls after uh, I think it was about maybe 30 seconds or so that passed so that you're not accidentally you know, bumping the things and you can see it's flashing there with the little padlock. So to unlock it, you just put your finger right here and hold it for a few seconds. And then you can see the padlock goes away. So again, on the big box, I've got it set to 36 degrees. And on the small box, I've got it set to seven degrees. By default, by the way, these were all in, in Fahrenheit, so that's nice. But we'll come back and check and see how long it takes to get up to temperature. It looks like it does have its own temperature sensors as well on the big box and the small box. And so they're reading 75 and 77 respectively. So we are just over an hour of time elapsed since I plugged the cooler in to start cooling down. And I noticed the compressor cycled off about 10 minutes ago roughly and then it just came back on so i believe it has reached its its set temperature let's hop over here to the the govi temperature sensor and kind of see what's going on so you can see it started out at that uh, almost 79 degrees there when we first put the sensor in the the cooler with the ambient temperature and then you can see that nice curve as it cooled down there so it's kind of interesting because it's showing that its temperature recording, at least right now, is right around 44 degrees. It's kind of flattened out there. And that corresponds to when I saw the compressor cycle off. So I'm gonna let this sit for a little bit longer and come back and just watch what the pattern is here on the temperature. But while I've got the phone open here, let's just hop over to the Victron and see what it's registering. So it is right now registering that it's pulling 48 watts. I think the highest that I saw it jump to was right around uh, 65 or 68 watts uh, with the compressor running at full speed. But it seemed like closer to what it's running now was more typical for the compressor, what kind of load it was drawing there. 
But I'm gonna keep an eye on this and just kind of see with the compressor cycling on and off where it's at. And then we'll hop back over to the, the Govi periodically and just see where that temperature uh, rests. Now we're just over the two hour mark and I wanted to check in again and show you where we're at on the temperature. So notice here on the Govi temperature that's inside the refrigerator compartment, we are reading 37.9 degrees. So basically 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember I set this to 36 degrees you can see here 36 degrees and so it is tracking very closely so i would say as far as how much time it takes for this refrigerator to cool down from you know ambient temperature it was about 78 degrees if i remember right i would say it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to get close to the range because you can see we started out here at that 79 degrees and then about 30 to 40 minutes later it started registering temperatures right around 45 degrees, 44. And then after the compressor cycled on and off, it started dropping down closer to our target range. You can see there 37.8 degrees, and that's at about two hours approximately. So really about 30 to 40 minutes, you know, to get close to the target temperature you set, but probably closer to two hours to really, you know, fine tune the temperature and get down to the goal temperature there. But what I'm gonna do next to continue our testing and answer the remainder of the two questions, which the second is, you know, what does the temperature fluctuation look like once this thing is already cooled down? And then the third question is how much energy does it use in a real world situation like this? You know, how long can you run it off of this 200 amp hour lithium battery bank. So what I'm gonna do is actually add some items to the refrigerator portion, because I suspect you know having things in there will impact the performance of the unit. So I'm not gonna load it up all the way, but I'm gonna put it probably about a third full. And so I'm just gonna reach in here and temporarily move that over to the freezer side and then put these drinks in here. Now these are all cooled down already, these drinks. I just pulled them out of the refrigerator. And so I imagine if these were not cooled down, you'd probably see a little bit of a dip on the, the temperature as it uh, tries to cool everything down. But I've got my temperature sensor back in here on the bottom. It's just resting on the grate there. And then I've got these drinks in here. Nothing on the frozen side yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and close it, make sure it's secured. And then I'm gonna let this thing sit, you know, overnight and probably check in in about 24 hours or so and see where we're at as far as the temperature fluctuations and how much time we have left on our battery bank here. Okay, so checking in again, we're now at 48 hours and 24 minutes approximately since I started running the refrigerator down here. I planned to come back and check at 24 hours, but I got really busy yesterday, so I figured I might as well let the experiment run a little bit longer, you know, get some more test data. But I wanted to come check in and see where we're at on the power. So you can see here on the Victron, on the battery monitor, we're at 75% capacity remaining. And again, that's a 200 amp hour lithium battery bank. So that means we've used approximately 25% of the, the batteries here, or we could say about roughly 50 amp hours running this over the last 48 hours. But let me also show you the temperature data with that Gobi temperature sensor that I placed inside the refrigerator compartment. So you can see I've got the raw data pulled up here and I'll just scroll to the left. You can see when we started 48 hours ago, it was at a max temperature of 79 degrees. So that's basically the ambient temperature outside here. And then I went ahead and plugged it in. You can see the temperature dropped down pretty quickly here. And then if I scroll, to the right a little bit, you can see as it goes up and down with the temperature, that's basically telling us when the compressor is cycling on and off. So this tells a really interesting story. Again, you can see this was about 48 hours ago, starting right here. And then we went through a full day right there. And if we keep on scrolling, you can see all the way to where we are at current. So again, basically all these ups and downs are signaling to us where the compressor turns on. Specifically, if you look at where it peaks and then drops, so where it peaks and then drops, that's where the compressor's actually running. In other words, it's you know lowering the temperature inside the refrigerator every time it comes on. And if you look at the peak and then where it drops and starts rising again, on average across the last 48 hours, the compressor has run about 20 minutes each time. So again, about 20 minutes each time that the compressor has 
cycled on. So that's kind of interesting. And then if you count the number of peaks here, you've got to get an idea of how many times that the compressor has cycled on over the last 48 hours. So based on what I'm seeing here, you know, I want to authenticate and verify the 25% consumption used on our, our battery bank there and just make sure everything's, you know, tracking right. If we look at these peaks and everything and how long they've been running, uh, combined with the fact that when the compressor did turn on, the Victron was showing me on average, I would say around 50 watts of consumption. You know, once in a while it would jump up to 55. I think one time when I first was starting it, it, it was up in the 60s, the low 60s. But most of the time I saw it, you know, 48, 49, 50 watts. So let's just say, let's be a little pessimistic and let's say 55 watts on average is how much the compressor is consuming uh, each time it turns on. And again, if you look at the graph here, each time it turns on, it's running for about 20 minutes or so. So if you count the number of peaks over a 14 hour period, again, this is me being a little bit pessimistic. It's approximately 14 times that the compressor turned on. That's kind of impressive if you think about it. You know, I left the cooler shut. It is outside here. And I mean, it only ran about 14 times in that 24 hour period. That's, that's pretty impressive, I think. Of course, you can look and see there's some variance in how uh, wide some of these peaks are. And that's because, you know, at night, the temperature, the ambient temperature outside here cooled down a little bit. I think it got maybe in the, the high 60s, 65, 66, 67. And then during the day, it warmed up. And I think yesterday it was in the high 80s. And so that makes sense why during the day the compressor had to run, you know, more frequently. But like I said, about 14 times on average through the course of a 24 hour period. And so basically, if we take all that data into consideration, and again, folks, I am rounding here, I'm being approximate just to make it easy for presentation but basically the refrigerator consumes about one amp per hour and that's a very broad average figure there and so if we go back to our 200 amp hour lithium battery bank and we ask the question okay well how long could we then run this cooler off of that 200 amp hour battery bank with the cooler being the only thing that's drawing you know current from the battery bank and so if we use that one amp per hour on average then that tells us that this refrigerator could run approximately, again, that's the key word, approximately eight days on that 200 amp hour battery bank. And that actually lines up pretty nicely with what the Victron battery monitor is telling us, you know, it's 75% capacity left, running it now for two days. I mean, that tells me that I could probably get another six days out of this battery bank with just the refrigerator running, you know, keeping all things consistent there. And so it tells me that what we're seeing here and what we're seeing on the temperature data, everything's consistent. You know, it all makes sense in the end. So again, to answer our third question, you know, how long can you run this refrigerator off of a 200 amp hour battery bank? I would say an average of, an average is being the key word, probably around eight days or so in total. And there's a lot of factors that, you know, go into that. I'm running my test outside here. It is in the shade, but it is outside. We've had temperatures, like I said, at night in the high 60s, in the daytime in the high 80s. I do have some uh, drinks in there that are on the refrigerator side, but the freezer side is empty. So, you know, what would happen if you filled it all the way to the brim with food and drinks? Would that change our data? What would happen if you put the cooler in the sun? Uh, what would happen if you put the cooler in a an air conditioned environment, you know, inside somewhere? So that's gonna change a little bit, but I think eight days is pretty safe on a 200 amp hour battery bank. So, I mean, that'd be four days on a 100 amp hour battery. So I think that's a pretty good estimation there, but let's go back to our second question and talk a little bit more about the, you know, temperature range here and the fluctuation, because you can see here on our temperature data, we have lows here, the min at 36.1 degrees, and then the max at 45. And I've got it spread, scaled here, pretty much to the last uh, 48 hours, roughly. And so that's a good indication of how the refrigerator actually performed over the last two days. So let's talk a little bit about this. You can see the average there is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Now remember, I set this to 36 degrees, right? And so a lot of people might be asking, well, why then is the, you know, minute 36, the highs at uh, 45, most of it's closer to 42, 43 here, if you look closely, but you know, why is this showing different temperature compared to what you set it to? And folks, we gotta be fair, you know, every refrigerator has a different algorithm for how it cools. 
and there's going to be variances and fluctuations in the set temperature versus what it's actually pulling in, you know, real world data. And the reason is, if you think about it, you know, I'm running a, a fairly accurate temperature sensor that's placed inside the cooling area. Whereas whatever is generating the cooling here and telling the compressor when to turn on and off, you know, it's not based on an external temperature sensor that's put inside the cooling space. They're probably registering, you know, different temperatures with the refrigerant running through and surrounding the refrigeration area. And it's got some software to take probably different factors into consideration to determine, you know, what is the true temperature of that box inside there. And so every refrigerator is going to have some variations between what you're setting it to here on a display versus what the actual real temperature is here in the box. Now, different brands might be a little bit different there. I've got here in the fifth wheel, a residential uh, Whirlpool side-by-side -side refrigerator, and it runs the opposite. When you set it to, let's say 37 degrees, the Whirlpool ends up setting the actual temperature closer to 35 degrees, so it's colder. And so I have to know, okay, I need to set the temperature a little bit higher so I don't freeze things. And just to give another example concerning the, the variance on that set temperature, I think going back about three years ago, roughly, I started using a Dometic 12 volt refrigerator, similar in size to this unit here, a little bit larger. I think it was the CFX3, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, concerning the variation, when I would set that Dometic to, let's say, 36 degrees, I would also notice fluctuations, you know, up and down with the temperature, just like we're seeing here. I think I probably saw about a four to five degree variance, you know, above and below the, the set temperature. Whereas here, if you look, we're probably closer to a, a six to seven degree from the bottom all the way up there to the, the top. But I say all that uh, as, you know, every refrigerator, I don't care if it's a residential refrigerator, you know, a, a smaller one that you plug in in a dorm room or a 12 volt unit, every refrigerator is going to have some variance there with the fluctuations of the temperature going up and down within that set range. You know, some might run a little bit colder, some might run a little bit warmer. It also depends sometimes where you put the temperature sensor. You know, I put mine at the bottom of the compartment. I mean, you can move it around a little bit and you're gonna get some different data. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is it's completely normal to have these fluctuations in temperature when you're running tests like this on any refrigerator. It doesn't matter if it's a you know portable 12 volt or even a residential, it's completely normal to have those fluctuations as the compressor turns on and off. And you know, if you think about it, it's for the sake of efficiency because this is clearly running a program every time the compressor turns on and off and what tells it to turn on and off. And if you think about it, if it was programmed to turn on, you know, every time the temperature dropped, you know, half a degree, you would see the compressor turning on and off, on and off much more frequently. That's gonna consume a whole lot more energy and so really it's all about efficiency. So, you know, every refrigerator is gonna be a little bit different there. And, you know, really one of the most important things I think is that we see consistency in our data. You know, if it's running a little bit hot, if it's running a little bit colder, that we see consistency all the way across there. And that we do. And so I think that tells us that this is keeping a very nice consistent temperature inside. And I mean, it's using a very small amount of energy in the end. All right, so here are my final thoughts on this Kori 12 volt refrigerator. And I'll just say up front that this is clearly a budget based choice, you know, a budget oriented choice here. You know, you could spend three times the amount that this one costs here, spend a thousand bucks and get a, a Dometic CFX series that's similar in size, right? Three times the cost, or you could buy this unit here. And you know, for a lot of us, money doesn't grow on trees and we live on budgets. And so being able to spend less and, you know, based on my test here, I would say you're gonna get probably 80% or more of the performance out of this Kori compared to a, a bigger name brand like Dometic and yet you're only spending a third of the cost. And so I think that's really what makes this unit so appealing. And in the end, remember the temperature data, it was very consistent over that 48 hour period and it's very energy efficient. So I mean, between those three selling points, it really makes this Kori a good buy. So my conclusion on the Kori 12 volt refrigerator is that it has a very, strong value proposition, you know, especially at the price point, you're gonna get those consistent temperatures inside. It's got the very low energy consumption and you don't need to spend 
a thousand dollars, right? I mean, most of us when we go camping, we go maybe a you know once a month for a few days at a time. And so, why spend a thousand dollars on a more expensive cooler if you don't have to? And I think that's what makes the Kori such an attractive choice here but definitely let me know what you think do me a favor and comment below a special thanks to Kori for giving me the opportunity to collaborate and as always thanks for watching